Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 101 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sapolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Fill in the blank. If I said medieval people drank, I'm guessing the majority of us just filled in that blank with the word beer or the word ale. I can't believe it's taken me over 100 episodes to get here, but it's way past time to talk about the ancient drink that's inseparable from our ideas about the Middle Ages and still beloved around the world, beer. This week, I spoke with Dr. Noelle Phillips about medieval beer, as well as the ways that we still tie the Middle Ages together with beer in today's world. Noelle is a member of the English faculty at Douglas College, as well as being an honorary adjunct assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. In addition to her academic papers, she's the author of Craft Beer Culture and Modern Medievalism, Brewing Descent, a book that I had the pleasure to work on with her when I was an acquisitions editor at Arc Humanities Press. Noelle knows everything about medieval beer, so here's our conversation about beer in the Middle Ages, who was making it, who was drinking it, and how the brewing industry leans on the medieval world for its marketing today. Well, thank you, Noelle, for joining me to talk about medieval beer. This is super exciting for me, and it's great to see you again. We worked a little bit together. I was helping edit your book on craft beer culture and modern medievalism, Brewing Descent. So it's great to be seeing you again and talking to you about beer. I know. It's really nice to talk to you face-to-face, sort of, (laughs) through a screen. (laughs) Thanks for having me on. I I will always talk about beer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, for the people who follow you on Twitter, We can see you are always consuming some delicious beer. You make me very jealous half the time because I haven't heard of half of these people, but maybe you can tell us at the end some of your favorites. All right, so let's start at the beginning. In the Middle Ages, who was brewing the beer? Like whose job was it to make it in the first place? Whose job? Well, the short answer is monks and women at home. Yeah, so monks brewed fairly consistently throughout the Middle Ages from basically when Christianity was established in the very early medieval period, continually throughout becoming more and more effective at it because the monasteries were often the ones with the most money, with the most resources available. They were also brewing, of course, not just for themselves, but also for sometimes for sale in the community, often for guests. So you'd have people staying at monasteries and you'd have an ongoing supply of beer and bread. You'd have the brew house beside the bakehouse so you see in like, the plans that we have extant from monasteries, and we, don't, we certainly don't have them for all, but in St. Gall, for example, you have three separate brew house areas. Like they clearly had this big brewing operation and it was prioritized because hospitality, having guests, just ongoing drink, daily drinking. There's various estimates about how much people would drink a day, but some monasteries, they'd have like a measured as a gallon a day, even for in households, you have household accounts that would measure for, say, eight pints per person a day. Within the households, that's a bit different. Obviously, the monasteries aren't brewing for households until about the 14th century, when it starts to shift. By far, the majority are women brewing in the household, selling maybe locally, but mostly brewing for their own homes. And, and their, their brewing would be kind of measured or, or tracked by local authorities to make sure that there's no cheating in the selling, that the beer is still high quality. But yeah, it's women and monks for the most part. And the women were kind of kicked out of it halfway through the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get to that in a second. But why was yeah. it the women's job in the first place to be doing the brewing at home? Oh, because making bread is intimately connected to brewing. So they required the same ingredients. They could even kind of cultivate yeast that was used in bread making for beer or kind of basically use the same kind of yeast forms. And it was considered a chore akin to baking because of the similarity in the ingredients and because it was something that was used for home life. They would share, I mean, within kind of villages and such, not many people would be kind of brewing individual crops of barley, for example. So they would share uh, among groups of households or villages, they would share access to crops of barley and oats and rye, but then within their own households, they'd make their own brew. But yeah, very much uh, considered a domestic chore and the cousin of baking. And we see the same thing actually in, in ancient texts. So Sumerian, ancient Sumerian, ancient Egyptian texts, we see bread being used to create beer, sometimes actually soaking the bread and fermenting it. And actually that became an early version of beer 
again, same ingredients. It's like you know, beer is liquid bread. And if you've heard that phrase before, um, but it's, it's really true. I think of that actually when I have a really good, like chewy beer, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had a chewy beer, but I think of that. It's like, this is like bread. It, it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and it actually was more nutritious at that time, right? Because of the ingredients they were using. It was mm-hmm. a bit stronger than in terms of nutrition, I think, than it is now. Is that right? Yeah, no, it was nutritious, um, often lower in alcohol content, but in terms of the grains, yeah. I mean, even look at look at now, you, you sometimes get women being instructed to drink Guinness or other forms of dark beer for breastfeeding, for example. Dark beers especially were very healthy. The beers may have been actually sour much of the time because there was very little in the way they could do to preserve it. There's a lot of obviously sanitation issues with sanitizing equipment, but it still had that high nutritional content, relatively low alcohol content, was just considered a key element of hospitality and home life. Exactly. So when we think about hospitality, home life, the nutrition in beer, can you tell us who was drinking beer at this time? Who is this for? Like everyone. (laughs) Everyone. I mean, even children. They'd often be given what we call small beer, so especially low alcohol. But, you know, you'd also have workers in the fields midday who might drink small beer or drink small beer in the morning when you don't want to, like, get trashed in the first, first thing in the morning. Uh, no, but it was absolutely for everyone, including in aristocratic households and poor households. <laughs> in fact, so there's a, an interesting example from Scotland. There was a, a law basically for women brewing. If they didn't make the beer kind of to standard, they would be charged. So basically they're cheating people. They're adding fillers or crap to the beer. They'd be charged and put on the cucking stool. And if anyone doesn't know the cucking stool, it's when they sort of dip the woman into the water as a form of public humiliation. I mean, obviously super misogynistic, but then they'd also give the beer to the poor. So the poor still got beer, but it was just, I guess, poor quality beer, but it was given to them rather than being just thrown away. (laughs) I guess it's better than nothing, right? (laughs) But it's hard to say, hard to say. I want to come back to women brewing for a second because women's uh, ability to brew and their talent in doing this and their experience in doing this gave them a second career after many of them were widowed, didn't it? Yeah. Or early in the Middle Ages, it was before they're widowed, but they would brew under the cover of their husband's name. And that was especially the case kind of after the plague in the mid 14th century. But before that, you have many, I mean, Judith Bennett's book is invaluable. So I always forget the order of the title. It's Judith Bennett's Medieval Ale, Beer and Ale Wives. That's not the correct title. <laughs> Sorry. We can find it. Don't worry. It's Judith Bennett's book on Ale Wives. Uh, and I just can't recall the title exactly right now. But but she describes, I mean, the records that she's uncovered and gone through in great detail. A surprising number of women brewed under their own names in that first half of the Middle Ages, just in their homes. But then later on, women were actually still brewing, but often under the names of their husbands instead. And even like as guild members, it might be when brewing guilds were formed in the mid 14th century and especially the 15th and 16th, women sometimes still brewed, although less so. But when they did, it was almost always under the name of their husband. So their husband would be listed as a guild member, but the woman's name wouldn't be included. Yeah, I think that's the case with a lot of guild trades where the women are working in a workshop. Yes, but they don't absolutely. Get credit. So what what do you think was responsible for the shift in brewing from women's work to work that's done under men's names? What do you think was responsible for that? I think it was responsible. There's a whole bunch of things that are responsible, I think. Um, (laughs) Usually, usually. There's there's a sort of movement and and Bennett addresses some of this and, and many authors have tried to kind of unpick what happened there. But certainly part of it seems to be related to the increase in public drinking practices you have taverns and then you have ale houses and or pubs rather is a sort of different names but basically one is just for drinking but one you could have drinking and food and as that latter one becomes more and more popular the kind of pub what we think of now as the pub format drinking and making beer becomes more of a publicly visible process so women would still brew in their homes before and they might put the little broom outside their door to let people know if there was local beer available but it wasn't like a fully a sort of institutionalized business. So the, basically the more business-like or industrialized it became, the more public it became, the less viable it was for women to work in that kind of public selling space, especially women that wanted to sort of be considered respectable women. 
And then, of course, women selling in those places also became part of a kind of pub culture with the increasing kind of sexual associations of that, women being treated like prostitutes in that context. So brewing became kind of tainted by that. And in our, I may talk about at the end, the forthcoming collection, I'm editing Carissa Harris, who's written a lot about misogyny in the Middle Ages, has an essay about women who sell beer and that association in the Middle Ages with prostitution and that kind of thing. So yeah, the public selling of beer is another thing. But in kind of conjunction with that, as beer becomes more part of the public market, let's put it that way, it also has to be produced on a larger level, right? A larger scale. So women often just did not have the resources to scale up production in that way. And you required wealth, you required capital, you required permissions from local government. You had to pay increasing taxes to to local government for uses of various additives and adjuncts and that kind of thing. You had to sort of adhere to the assize of bread and ale laws. So there's all sorts of kind of legal and economic constraints that start to be imposed when industry is scaled up like that, which I know that nowadays craft brewers absolutely recognize that. The problem of scaling up and all the additional stresses and strains that comes with that. So I think the sort of public drinking environments and the commensurate increased industrialization or also increased technology, like the the enhancements of, of brewing technology also combined to, to make women feel less than welcome in these environments. Yeah, I think that, that a lot of the things that you're saying are also tied to how people think about beer, especially when people think about beer in kind of a medievalist way, which I want to get to in a second. This idea of the beer wench, right? That's something that's very much part of modern medievalism when it comes to beer. One of the things that you talk about in your book is that beer gives people kind of a regional identity that they can be proud of. So how did this work in the Middle Ages? Like what went into beer making that made people so proud of it in terms of regional identity? Whatever was to hand, (laughs) basically. (laughs) You see some regions much more conscious of it. There's a poem that I cite in the book, a famous Irish poem, specifically kind of lists different kinds of beer associated with different peoples and groups in Ireland. And and these groups have different kinds of uses for them. Like that's sort of what the poem implies. And I mean, it depends on the sort of like in, in, in wine, you have terroir, like the sort of what's in the dirt. How does that change the flavor I know of the, of the plant, of the grapes? I think there's something that similar happens with beer. How much access do you have to barley? How is it growing? If you are in an area that will grow wheat or oats more easily than barley, that's going to change it. Same with rye. So the use of the grain, of course, later on, the use of additives and what we kind of loosely call grew it now. And I'm going to be very careful with that term because it's actually, a, technically it's a term that also only refers to certain areas in, in the Netherlands, but herbal additives basically were there to flavor beer according to whatever region you're in. So you have the barley, how well is the barley growing? How well are the other grains growing? You also have different herbal additives, rosemary or bog myrtle, yarrow, juniper. Of course, in Scotland, you have like heather ale, right? So we have all these different possibilities for flavoring beer according to the landscape that you're in. And we see that with modern craft brewing now, of course, is a kind of the pride in, in regional variation and regional uniqueness. So those herbal additives before hops became really popular were really important in making beer very regional, but also because hops weren't there or weren't being used, they were also restricted to the region because um, most of the time beer wouldn't be moving very far. It wouldn't, it wouldn't last very long. So it would be brewed in the area and for the vast majority of the time it would stay in that area. And so people visiting would be like, oh, they have great beer down here in Kent or whatever, right? The lack of hops kind of helped keep beer a local, small scale, you know, 100 mile diet, (laughs) not 100 mile diet, more like five mile diet (laughs) phenomenon. And hops, of course, changed that. So yeah, I want to come back to hops. But one of the things I thought was funny in, in the book was that Thomas Beckett ended up being a patron saint of London brewers because the beer that he made while he was still alive from like the monk's pond bath water yeah, yeah. <laughs> was great and everyone loved oh, it. Yeah. Well, yeah, water's a whole other thing, actually. So Burton-on-Trent, I mean, Burton-on-Trent's beer is very unique because of the nature of its water. And yeah, so I mean, the gross, disgusting water from his pond, I guess somehow he made great beer with it. <laughs> enough, <laughs> enough that the king sent it over to France, a very early example of beer being exported. Very unusual. 
But if, the, if anyone's going to do it, the king's going to do it, right? So, <laughs> so the dirty bath water or dirty, uh, <laughs> dirty, dirty laundry water is good enough for the king of France. I just thought I, that was a great story. <laughs> I know. Well, why do St. Saint Bridget was said to have made, uh, early Irish saints in the ninth century said to have made beer out of her bath water and then serving it up to people. So <laughs> it's miraculous. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Bridget in your book too that talks about wanting to have a lake of beer to share with everybody from God down to the poorest people. <laughs> yeah, totally. She thinks of heaven as like a giant beer party. Like just, <laughs> yeah, I'm with her on that. That sounds good. <laughs> There's a lot of joy in beer. Well, I came across that because I was working on a book on monks. And I think that we think of that alcohol not really being, uh, especially parties of alcohol, not really being a monastic thing or a saintly thing. But it was different in the Middle Ages, especially when you have monks that are brewing it a lot. Oh, yeah. And monks were drinking beer like every day. <laughs> yeah, no, they were drinking every day. Although if sometimes the very holy ones, their holiness was emphasized by the fact that they would drink only water. So, but that was like the really special ones. But for the most part, monks had an assigned amount of alcohol, like beer that they would have every day. But it wasn't considered a vice though. Beer starts to be looked at more as a vice after the Middle Ages, actually, more like the 18th century, maybe 17th century, but not right in the Middle Ages. It was, it was seen much more as just sort of a daily kind of drink. Yeah, something that it's not really a big deal <laughs> unless you have way too much of it. And then you yeah. have to do some penance. <laughs> Um, but I should ask, when did people start adding hops? Because I know that beer and ale, it's a terminology thing that people are always thinking about when they're thinking about the Middle Ages. So when did hops become a thing? Ale is a term, first of all, like for those that don't know, usually refers to unhopped beer, <laughs> basically. So ale is generally thought of as being without hops and beer as being hopped. That doesn't always hold true, but I will say that etymology of ale is much more clearly tied to what we think of now as beer ale than beer is the term beer is hops are mentioned and it probably used as early as about the eighth century but not consistently and not for the purposes that we think of using them now so i think it's about the 13th century in germany where it, that's like one of the earlier places that start to use it um, 14th century in the netherlands england doesn't it does they don't really take off in england until closer to the mid 15th century but certainly it's on the continent that we see it more and we sort of wonder, well, they knew about hops, like Hildegard von Bingen knew, refers to hops in the 12th century. So like, why didn't they use them more? Because they clearly knew it had preservative qualities. There's an idea that perhaps they were harder to grow, like the question of how much could you grow for usage? What was the cost versus the cost of gruit or other herbal additives? The question of the flavor and whether people liked it. Like, so there's all sorts of, of questions about why people didn't use hops earlier when they knew about it. It's probably more about access to growing it easily and the cost. But yeah, not until like 13th century is I think the earliest that it starts to become widely used in European countries. But it certainly we have records of it being used from like 500 years before that. Yeah, it's just something that I figure is worth clearing up because people are always trying to figure out which term they should use when they're talking about what people are drinking in the Middle Ages. I know. Yeah. I mean, so ale is probably more accurate just for consistency. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk about how people are using the Middle Ages right now when they're creating images for their own craft beer. So we see this a lot. People are leaning on the Middle Ages when they're building an identity for their craft beer. So how do you see this working right now in, in the modern period? I think that we're seeing in the craft industry for the past like 40 years now, a real pushback against a kind of homogenous beer culture. And, and that used to be really valued. And in fact, if you are a fan of the people that are fans of Bud or Molson or whatever, that is actually what's valuable to them is that it is all the same. No matter where you go, it's all the same is consistent across the world. There's a pushback against that with people that want uniqueness. They want regional variation. They want to understand a locality, an area based on the kind of beer they produce. But another way to kind of create uniqueness or to create a tie to the local is to also create a tie to history. So people often think of beer as having originated in the middle ages or being a kind of medieval thing, like very vaguely, which I always find interesting because it's of course not like it's thousands of years before that, that again, within middle Eastern and North African countries that we see beer first being brewed. 
but very few breweries use that. There's a few that do. And instead, most of them, I think, as a kind of thinking about the North American heritage of European colonization, will look to Europe as a kind of birthplace, as a place of origin. And so this image of beer being brewed before a time when it was all mechanized, in a kind of pre-modern time when the person making the beer is right there in the room, like it's made by hand, it's crafted. It's really an echo of the 19th century where they had a similar anxiety to industrialization, to machines making clothes and stuff. They want to go back to a time when people would make the things that we produce. And with beer, that there's something similar happening there. We're looking back to a time when beer was made for the local area. It reflected the local area. It reflects something specific about that time. So in my book, I kind of talk about how the desire for the local in modern craft parlance can kind of be subbed in or kind of replaced by this desire for a new kind of origin. So if one origin is your local area, another origin is your kind of cultural origin. And many people think, especially in North America, think of medieval Europe as the sort of place of our cultural origins. So we think of it as a place where we start to understand how men should treat women or you know, how countries should be led or, you know, uh, when the scientific method was first developing. We think of it as, as a place of origin. doesn't mean it's an accurate perception of our origins and, in fact, can lead to some kind of problematic assumptions. But I think breweries are often appealing to that desire for origin, that desire for connection to what you consume. And instead of sort of using their local area necessarily to do that, they're kind of representing their their brewery and their beer as part of an, an earlier time. Obviously knowing that the brewery didn't really come from that time, but using symbols, using concepts and ideas and illustrations and fonts that make us think of that, even subconsciously. There's an emotional kind of uh, tug there that makes us feel connected to our histories. Well, that's a great answer. So, <laughs> wow, awesome. <laughs> Um, well, where do you see this situating itself? Like, I think we think of Vikings as being beer drinking people with their big drinking horns and stuff like that. But where do you see it situating itself when it comes to craft beer culture? Do you see it situating itself in the monastery, in Viking age? Where do you see it mostly happening? There's almost like half and half. What, what, what's <laughs> interesting yeah, I've written about this. I'm writing a new one about actually about Vikings specifically right now. So I've thought a lot about Vikings and beer. We see a lot of the monastic stuff in, in brewing. Even though nuns did brew, we see almost nothing in modern craft brewing linking brewing to nuns. And almost very little, honestly, linking brewing to any medieval female figure. It's, it's still quite unusual. It's almost all male figures, almost all white male figures. So it tends to look back to this very white male past, which I understand the kind of aesthetic of it, but I'm also a bit troubled by it because this is, again, an industry that tends to be very white, very straight, very male. I do love the industry and it is changing, but there are people that still feel a bit like they don't belong. And I think that's unfortunate. It is changing, but I think we need to kind of not assume that all the, all the problems are gone. So the monastic model, it kind of aligns with that sense of sort of white medievalism, a sort of sense of the white European monastic, holy, sort of the, the dedication to the beer, the focus on beer as a product that deserves our full attention and engagement. I think a lot of those ideas is what the monastic branding really draws upon. And sometimes even beer is a kind of spiritual thing, right? Beer is kind of magical. It kind of transforms us. So the one side is monastic. It tends to be more serious. It might even tell stories of saints to give it a kind of gravitas, taking us back to this, the origins of brewing, the true quote unquote, true origins of brewing went in the monasteries, ignoring any nunneries, of course. But then the, the militant or the kind of violent side, Vikings or pirates, or sometimes even fantastical fake, you know, dragons, people fighting dragons and that kind of thing. What I like about that actually is that it seems to hyperbolize the kind of white male ma masculinity that has sort of been informing much of all of the beer industry for like 50 years now. So what we imagine as like, say, a strong Viking, it's a figure that is long 
and deeply rooted in our society since the 19th century when they started to see Vikings as connected to the growth of the British Empire and this kind of thing. And also Vikings as a way to redeem the sins of colonization. So instead of focusing on some of the problems with Columbus and what have you, we have Vikings who are the kind of these strong, big figures. But we we are able in this kind of branding to actually erase all the problems with actual Vikings with the fact that they tended to kill everyone who was they were colonizing and instead focus on them as explorers. And so you see actually in a lot of modern branding, not just beer of anything, Vikings are cast as explorers. They're strong, they're masculine. There's always a kind of edge of violence about them, but they are explorers. They're in a new land. This is very much like the ethos of the craft beer pioneers, the, the men, mostly men, who started these, these breweries early on. So the Viking, it becomes this powerful figure, right? Especially like a revolutionary exploratory figure. But then it's almost like once you push it beyond a certain point, it becomes too much. And craft beer is using that now. So they're now taking the Viking figure with this hyper-masculine energy and this kind of stereotype of a man. And they're playing with that stereotype. They're kind of pushing it further to make it into something that they can parody, that they can have fun with. You don't see that actually really with the monastic branding, but you see it with this militantly masculine branding, a willingness more recently to kind of play with that sense of masculinity, to parody it. Because as soon as it becomes too much, and really it has by this point, like over the years, it's become beyond realistic. Uh, And so that parodying allows us to kind of laugh at the masculinity that has energized the beer industry. And it actually helps the beer industry kind of shed its reliance on that sense of masculinity because the Viking no longer just becomes a man. There's also a kind of, I think there's a kind of degendering of the Viking too. That's a bit of a separate issue, but it's a bit of a long answer, but I basically, I think the monastic and the Viking branding in breweries, I think we see lots of both. I think they function really differently. And I think the monastic ones tend to take themselves a bit more seriously and kind of reinforces some of the gendering issues we see in breweries. And I think the Viking ones, surprisingly, are actually starting to allow us to make fun of the gendering issues in in brewery branding. So I like that. I think it's fun. And I also think that you're seeing more and more that are looking at, for example, not just Viking male Vikings, but say Norse goddesses and that kind of thing, which is fun. And I'm Actually, this week I'm releasing, I'm partnering with a brewery to release a beer named after a, a Norse goddess, which is kind of exciting because it's uh, it's using a Norwegian yeast and it was a yeast that was a gift to us. So we're sort of thinking of, of Freya as a goddess who gave of her possessions to others and who was a powerful, one of the most powerful gods in the Norse pantheon. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about Vikings and beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's <laughs> nice, though. It's nice to see medievalism being used as a way to kind of counter old narratives, especially because we, we do see medievalism being used as a weapon in, in lots of ways. So yeah. it's nice to see it being pushed back against that kind of stereotype. It's great. And you're actually working on a collection right now of all sorts of scholarship regarding beer. So where is the scholarship taking us now into the future? Where is the scholarship <laughs> taking us? Yeah, so this is a collection of essays uh, edited by myself, Rosemary O'Neill from Kenyon College and John Geck from Memorial University. And it's basically a sort of mix of genres <laughs> and focuses. It's partly about beer history. So we have examinations of historical sources of what was Gruet, what were these uh, sort of Icelandic and Norse practices in making beer early medieval practices in making beer. But we also have examinations of texts. So beer, you know, riddles, for example, one of our contributors is examining riddles about drinking and about beer. Um, I mentioned Carissa Harris's article about medieval tapsters connecting this to modern day restaurants like Hooters and, and similar franchises. And then we also have medievalism. So Harris's article also participates in that. But for example, my piece is really focused on Vikings and Viking medievalism more broadly in our culture, but then also Vikings in beer branding. John Geck, his piece is looking at Canadian breweries and the way medievalism and fantasies of colonialism, specifically for Canada, how those operate and function in beer brands in Ontario and Quebec. And then 
we have some pieces on alewives and there's just a lot of really interesting interesting stuff you know analyses of chaucer the partner and why he drinks and so a mix of history and some archaeology and some modern medievalism and just lots of different things <laughs> that's awesome and i'm really looking forward to seeing that book when it comes out do you have a working title for it right now Beer and Brewing in Medieval Culture and Contemporary Medievalisms, I think. Well, that covers it all. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's both about medieval history and it's about medievalism. It's about what happened in the Middle Ages and it's about how do we talk about the Middle Ages? How do we use it in the way we represent what we're doing now? So we're doing both of those things in this book. Which is perfect because I think that you can't really look at how it's being used now without looking at how people brewed or thought about beer in the Middle Ages as well. Yeah, so I think it all it's complementary, and I think there'll be a little bit of something for for everyone, for lots of different people. <laughs> I think there's going to be stuff in here that's really interesting to to craft brewers who want to know more about the history of brewing, and I think there's going to be stuff of interest to like literary scholars who never drink beer. So <laughs> it's a perfect book for everyone. So we'll have to look forward to that coming out and give people a link when it comes out. But before I let you go, I should ask you, what are some of your favorite beers? So is this one that you're releasing in honor of International Women's Day? Uh, it's a Freya one, is it? And is that available to most people? Oh, it's going to be just available in a craft brewery. I helped to brew it. I was in the brewery. I've learned from the head brewer, who's a woman. And I'm a home brewer myself, but yeah, unfortunately, it's just going to be available in the Vancouver area. But it's a Kvai Kazi IPA, and it lots of mango flavors with like an earthy kind of undertone. Very delicious. But my usual, I mean, I have to say, like, I'm a big fan of Belgian. I love actually Belgian style beers, doubles and triples, and any kind of Abbey style ale. Really love the Belgian yeast. And I really love saisons. So saisons with that unpredictable yeast. And I was with the yeast retinomyces. You never know what it's going to do. I love the unpredictability of that. There's something I find fascinating about beers whose final output we're never quite sure of. So saisons and probably Belgian triples are, are two of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I always see you on Twitter, like I said, with some really cool beers. And I remember when we were putting the books together, I got to see some really great medievalist logos for beers too, which I is know. exciting. Some really fun stuff that they, they do for their branding. I really admire a lot of what craft brewers are doing. So my kind of cultural analysis is certainly not meant to take away from anything that these brewers are doing. It's hard work to be a craft brewer, but it's, all, it's also worth kind of evaluating how have we represented ourselves? How do we use history? Can we do better in our use of history? Yeah. And I think that's the name of the game. And that is why I wanted to have you on the podcast. So thanks so much, Noelle, for talking to us about medieval beer. Thank you so much for having me. You can find Noelle on Twitter at Belladonsa. That's B-E-L-L-A-D-O-N-S-A-H. Or you can find her on academia.edu at douglas.academia.edu slash Noelle Phillips. Her book is Craft Beer Culture and Modern Medievalism, Brewing Descent, and you can find it, along with all the other books mentioned on the podcast, at our new bookstore, amazon.com slash shop slash medievalists. Before we go, here's Peter from medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new this week, Peter? Hey, hey. So we've got a couple of really interesting pieces. First from Catherine Walton. She's talking about the trial of William Blankton. The Bishop of Coventry and Lakefield in the early 14th century gets uh, charged with witchcraft. More about being too close to the king. But that's a nice little interesting piece. Plus, we have Alice Sullivan, and she's starting to kind of look a bit of a mini-series about Mouth Athos. And that is in Greece. This is a kind of a, a little spot where there's about 20 medieval monasteries. And so she's going to be talking about it for the next couple of months. And like this one is talking about like how it survived and prospered thanks to a whole bunch of kings from the and monarchs and rulers from the Byzantine Empire to Romania to Serbia. They all kind of supported this monastic site. So those two features are on the site and we've got a few more uh, pieces as well coming along. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon.com for your generosity, which makes this podcast possible. Patrons of the Medieval Podcast can get access to some pretty cool stuff, 
like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, membership in our book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. To become a patron of the Medieval Podcast, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from beer to Beowulf, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Savalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at our new online bookstore. That's amazon.com slash shop slash medievalists. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening and have yourself a delicious day.